Hey there everybody, Chili here. Welcome back to tutorial 7 of Beginner C++ Game Programming. And I am excited. We're almost ready to make our first shitty game. But before we do, there's somebody I'd like you to meet. His name is Mr. Debagur, and he is fucking awesome. I'm also demoing a new segment at the end of this video where I give sage chili advice. Dig it. Now you may be under the impression that programming is all about churning out code to create awesome shit, but actually, it's all about squashing bugs. Bugs as far as the eye can see. Especially if you're just starting out, you're gonna be a veritable bug factory. And if that sounds about as fun as eating a bag of dicks in hell, that's because it is. But there is good news. You have this delicious special sauce called the debugger that you can pour on those dicks right before you chow down to make them a little less disgusting. It still sucks ass though. Alright, so this here code can be found on the wiki if you want to follow along. And all it is is the solution from the tutorial 6 homework where we uh, draw, I believe we're drawing four stationary boxes and one mobile box. And we are detecting whether the mobile box is colliding with any of the stationary ones. And we're doing it all with functions. Very nice. The difference between this code and that code is I took a big steaming dump in the middle of this code somewhere. Let's try to find it. Now, when you're going to use the debugger to debug a program, you've got to make sure you've got a few things set up. First of all, make sure you've got the fucking solution in debug mode, otherwise you're wasting your time. Uh, you should be running mostly in this mode anyways, just for safety, but especially when you're debugging. Second, make sure you run the program by clicking this button and not some other button, because this is the one that will actually attach the debugger. I should also note that I've gotten a few reports of people getting crashes when they try to debug, and the solution to that has been set your solution to 64-bit mode if you have any crashes like that, and that seems to have fixed the problem for those people. So if you have a problem crashing, try setting it to 64-bit mode. Alright, let's do this. Click the debugger, and assertion failed, okay. And you get a bunch of bullshit, and press retry to debug the application, which is what we want to do, retry. And now you get a breakpoint thing, and you want to break, because breaking is what lets you step through your code and check it out, and all that good stuff. So here we are. Where the hell are we? Now, the way a program is generally structured, it's its functions calling functions calling functions all the way down, in a chain or in a stack, if you like. And the point that we have broken into the program, we paused execution, we are a little too far deep into the C++ code. We're, right now, we're inside of the, uh, the standard library, and we have no idea about this. But it's okay, because we got some fat stacks. Oh, by the way, uh, if you, you might be missing some of these windows if you had closed them by accident previously, like this. Yoink. And if that's the case, all you gotta do is go to debug, windows, and find the one that you want, like the call stack in here. And that'll bring it back. So this is the, uh, the stack of function calls, which calls called which ones, called which ones, all the way up to where we are right now. And so what we want to do is we want to go down this list until we get to a point where we can say, aha, I know what this might be. And here we go. This is something familiar, right? Put pixel. Good old put pixel. Now remember in tutorial 5 I said that r building in debug mode gives you some extra safety checks. Well these are the safety checks. These are called assertions. They're like special functions. They halt your program and display an error message when the expression evaluates to false. Now there's a few neat things about assertions. First of all, they are omitted when you switch to release mode. And that's really neat because in debug mode you can have them in here and get extra safety checks. But those safety checks are going to slow your code down. So once you've ironed all the bugs out of your program you can switch to release and right away you get a big speed boost. Another neat thing about these assertions is that they give you a lot of information. Watch when I run this again. Look at this, assertion failed. It tells you the file and the line where the problem, where the assertion was tripped. 
and it tells you the expression that evaluated to false. And that's a lot of information. It's a big hint on what went wrong. Now take a look down in this window called autos. Autos. One of the amazing things about the debugger is it lets you inspect the contents of variables as the program is running. Now the autos window here is going to show you variables that the debugger thinks you'll probably be interested in. And if we take a look at the Y variable here, we see that indeed it is out of bounds, which is what tripped this assertion. But the problem here isn't in put pixel, it's just following orders. We need to figure out who ordered this poo poo platter. So if we go up a level, we see that put pixel is being called by put pixel, which sounds strange, but this is just a different version of put pixel that takes, you know, XY RGB, and that one calls the version that takes XY color. It's just a kind of adapter. If we go up another level into the draw box function, we see here that nope, this one draw box, the problem isn't here because it was passed a value of Y of 700. So the problem must lie outside of draw box. And if we go into compose frame, it's a little confusing, but this arrow here indicates the next statement to be executed. So what we're, what's actually being currently executed is the statement before this, which is this statement. So we can see now that the problem could be somewhere in here. And if you look closely, you'll see that the Y and the X have actually been switched. And that was the problem the whole time. Case closed. Now sometimes the problem lies in a different place than where the program actually shits the bed. And not all bugs result in crashes, much like farts. The worst ones are silent but deadly. If you try and run the, uh, the second solution that is in on the wiki page, included in the zip file, you'll see that you can move up and down here, but you're stuck on the right hand side of the window. And that's kind of a problem, right? Now you probably want to solve this with the debugger, but you might ask the question, well Chili, how am I going to debug if the program doesn't shit the bed and let me break? You set your own breakpoint. In this area here, if you click, you can set what's called a breakpoint. And when the execution reaches that point, the program will pause and allow you to interact with the debugger. Now if we start debugging, it is going to automatically break into this part of the code and we can step through and see how our uh, variables are being affected. Now the command to step over or step through your statements one by one is the step over command. And you press this and you see it steps, oh, it steps through this and executes it. And you can see here in the autos you get some information. You get the return value of this function call. And because this block was related to xmobile, the automatic variable window is going to show you the value of xmobile, because it thinks you might be interested in it. Now these function calls should all return false, because, you know, we're not pressing any buttons, we're in the debugger. Now when we step over this statement, we see that xmobile has been set to 794. Whenever there's a change in a variable, it's going to be highlighted in red here. Now that doesn't make any sense because clamp to screen should only change the value of x if x has gone outside of the allowed region, but 700 is a valid value for x. So there's something wrong in clamp screen. So let's stop start debugging again and see what's going on inside of clamp screen x so what we can do is we can do instead of going step over step into will actually enter the function in the debugger he puts the hand deeper and now we can step through this code and see what's going on so the left is calculated and seems good the right is calculated also seems perfectly well uh, we're going to check to see if less is less than zero did not enter, that's correct. Right is greater than screen width, that's fine. So that means we must hit the default case here, which is return screen width minus six, which is the case when we're past the right hand side of the screen. But the tests here have proven that we are inside the allowed region, so we shouldn't be returning this, we should be just returning the original value of x, meaning no change, like here in the y. So. There we go, we found our problem, it's right goddamn here. Case closed. Now like I said before, the, uh, the autos window here shows you variables that the debugger thinks you will be interested in. You also have another window here called locals, and that just shows you all the local variables for the current function. Now you may say, well Chili, where's all my variables? All I got is this thing called this. 
I didn't make a variable called this. Now this is a special variable. Update model is a member function of game, and what that means is when you call update model, you call it with respect to a game object. And the this variable is a reference to the game object on which this function was called. So this is the game object, and if you open it up like this, here you'll see all your member variables all in here. So if autos is not showing you what you want to see, you can also take a look at locals and try to find it in there. Now the debugger is obviously great for finding bugs, but it's also pretty neat just to see how the code is working under the hood. So you can step through your code and, you know, verify what's happening to all the variables. Let me show you one interesting other feature, and that is the step out. Step out will run to the end of the function, and then it will return to the function that called this function, and then it will break. So if I do step out, it's going to return to whoever called update model, and that was the go function. And here you can step over these guys. And if I step out again, I can see who called the game go member function. And here we see the game loop where we process Windows messages and then we generate a frame of the game. Uh, note there, one second, I'm going to do this again, I'll step out, step out. Note that if we try to step over game, it's actually going to take us to the breakpoint. So if you're trying to step over something but there's a breakpoint in between, it'll always stop at the breakpoint. And it's the same if you try to continue. If, you, if you're stepping through your code and you press continue, it's going to just continually run until it hits a breakpoint. And if you want to have your program running normally, just remove the breakpoint and then press continue. And there you go. You're good to go. So that's it for the Chili Crash Course on basic debugging. It should be enough to get you started, and maybe later on I'll do another one of these showing you some more advanced techniques with the debugger. But let me know in the comments if you're interested, if you like this video on the debugger. My final advice to you as a programmer and a debugger is try to make as few assumptions as possible. Oftentimes when we're creating some code we and we find a bug, we assume that it's in a certain place and we just we're blind to anything else. And that is probably the biggest block you're going to have in being successful as a debugger. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten posts on the forum and people have described their problem and they've post part of their code where they think the error is and the error is not in that part of the code, it's somewhere else. So keep an open mind and don't assume. Alright, it's time for Chili's Dank Meta Nugs. This is a new segment where I dispense dank nuggets of wisdom about learning programming. Basically, there are two things I want to say today. Number one, don't binge watch the tutorials. And number two, make sure to practice, play, and experiment with the C++ language. Now, I get it. I know that feel when, you know, you're on fire and you're really getting it. You just can't stop. But trust me, it's easy to burn out if you try to maintain that pace. Aim for, at most, watching one episode a day, and better, one episode every two days. This gives some time to let new ideas sink in. It's better than rushing and only getting maybe half the benefit of a video. I can't make these videos as fast as you can watch them, and they're gonna run out, so make them last and make them count. Just as important, spacing out your viewing sessions will give you more time to practice and experiment with C++. Which leads me to a question. Are you just following along with the video code and doing the homework, or are you experimenting yourself with the new things that we've been learning? You need to be fucking around on your own initiative. You know, people, sometimes people ask me, you know, they want more homework, it's not enough. But you see, you need to be creative enough to come up with your own ideas for practice. Take the code from the videos and the homework and, you know, change values, duplicate statements, change the order of things, you know, break shit, see what happens. Or give yourself some small challenges. Like, you remember how we got the sprite to stay within the window boundaries, and then we got the sprite to detect collision with another uh, sprite? Try in something different. Try to, like, detect a collision in a region like this, and see if you can figure out how that works. Experiment with the code, ask questions, you know, like, can a statement like this that has nothing in it, can that build properly? The answer is, yes it can. Neat. 
just dumb stuff like what happens if I put the const after the int? And the answer is this works too. And you know, maybe like even try and figure things out before I introduce them. Like I've shown you the addition and subtraction operators, but if you look on the number pad, you've also got these guys, which you probably know represent multiplication and division. So you might try them out and see if they actually work that way in C++. Just a little experiment. I can't show you every permutation and every quirk of the language, but it can be fun for you to just try to figure this thing out. Just play around with the language. And most important of all is you're now at the point where you can start to create simple games on your own already. It's easy to only see limitations and, you know, tell yourself, I need more, I need to be able to load these images, or I need to be able to draw triangles and sprites and dick lasers, and but that is entirely the wrong mindset. Instead of feeling like you don't have enough tools, enough resources to make something cool, just Take it as a fun challenge. What is the most awesome thing I can make with these limited resources? Doing this will not only help you grow as a programmer, but it's also going to develop your imagination and your self-motivation, which arguably are some of the most important things of all. Just keep the scale small and keep your ambitions low at the beginning and then gradually increase as you gain successes. And for those of you out there who aren't, you know, following along or doing the homework, that's okay if you're just watching these videos for entertainment or you're just interested. But don't fool yourself into believing that you're actually learning how to program by doing that. You have to code and you have to do this shit on your own if you want to become an actual programmer. And that's it for today's dank meta nugs. Now it's time for the homework. Now since I introduced the debugger in today's episode, I've got a little bit of a different kind of homework for you. What I've done is I've zipped up a few solutions and I have uploaded them to the website. You can find the link on the wiki page for this tutorial. Link's in the description. So what I want you to do is download the solutions and debug them. Find the problems and fix them. And I can already read the comments, I'm so special I found the problem without the debugger. That's not the point, you dingus. Use the goddamn debugger. Real bugs are going to be a lot fuckier to find than the ones in this little homework code. But that'll about do it for today. Let me know in the comments if you enjoyed this little uh, introduction to the debugger and if you would maybe like to see a little more advanced debugging techniques in the future. And I'll see you again soon with some more C++.